Hello everyone and welcome to an asynchronous review of the can do descriptors. I do want to point out here um, that this is a 101 review and so if you are very familiar with the can do descriptors then this session may not be for you as I am uh, more so going over the organization of the document and providing just one um, quick example of how the can do descriptors could be utilized by classroom teachers. Um, but if that is you, then let's go ahead and jump right into this presentation. So first and foremost, we do want to get an idea of what can-do descriptors are. So can-do descriptors, it's a tool that helps you meet your students where they are in their language development. The can-do descriptors are going to highlight what language learners can do at various proficiency levels. And so this document is really useful um, when you're thinking through how am I going to scaffold these assignments for um, the various proficiency levels of English learners that I have in my classroom. I am not going to play this video just for the sake of time, um, but I will link it to ensure that you have access to it if you want to watch that at your um, leisure. Um, so um, very quickly, we're going to hop into the organization of the can do's. The can do's um, is a document that exists on the WIDA website, and I will um, link that as well. So once you get to um, the page on the WIDA site, it's going to look like this at the top. It's going to sort of um, summarize what the can-do descriptors are, but as you continue to scroll down, the um, PDF version for the different grade um, level or grade bands um, uh, is going to be right here. Um, if you work with students in kindergarten through grade 12, they're um, all here, and then down at the bottom, um, there are going to be the can-do descriptors for practitioners who work with students in early years. So it goes all the way from two and a half to five and a half. So if you work with pre-kindergarten students, then that um, this document is uh, for you. For the purpose of this video, I am looking at the can-do descriptors for grades two through three. So let's hop right into the organization of this document. So the first thing that you're going to look at are these key uses. Key uses are, um, were created based on an analysis of the college and career readiness standards. And what um, was found was that these standards are typically asking students to do one of these four different things or these four different key use areas. So they're either asking students to recount, explain, argue, or discuss. And so when you're looking at your activities, what you want to first think about is, what is this activity asking my students to do? Are they being asked to summarize a story? Then I'm looking at the key use area of recount. Are they being asked the why or the how of an idea, an action, or a phenomena? Then I'm going to be looking at the key use area of explain. Are they being asked to state a preference or their opinion or construct an argument using evidence? Then I'm looking at the key use area of argue. Or is this a large or small scale group activity or project where students are going to be asked to discuss something, then I'm looking at the key use area of discuss, okay? So now let's hop into these key use areas. Um, and so the first one is recount. And what you're going to find is that all of the key use areas are broken up into the four language domains. So they span typically over two pages. So here's the key use of recount, but we're looking, um, it's broken up into listening, speaking, reading and then writing. So you see they span over two pages. The same thing is going to um, be the way that it's set up for each domain except for um, the domain of discuss. So explain is also listening, speaking, reading, and then writing. Again, it spans two pages, but when you get down to discuss, um, there's only one um, area that we're looking at, which is going to be oral language, because obviously when we're discussing, um, we're thinking about how we're producing something, uh, producing information orally. Um, and so it's broken up that way. Okay. And then another really important piece to be thinking about the way this document is organized are proficiency levels. So what proficiency level is my student at based on either access data or we to model data or observational data. So you could be um, looking at a student who placed at level 1.5 um, um, as, as determined by a WIDA model, but then now 
at this point in the year, you're feeling more like they're functioning at a level two. Um, and that's something that we can dive a little bit more deeply into um, if I were holding a um, synchronous session. Um, but for the purpose of time and for this video, um, we're just going to sort of stick with um, looking at the organization of the document and thinking through some activities again. Um, so here we are at our proficiency levels. And as you can see, it spans from level one all the way up to level six. A lot of times when teachers reach out to me, they're really concerned about this level one and level two student. And so we typically spend a lot of time looking down here and um, we will for the purpose of this video. Um, so this is how we look at the document. We're thinking of our task or our assignment. What are they asking our student to do? Okay, they're asking our student to recount because they're asking them to summarize some information. Um, and how are they asking them to recount? Are they asking them to write something? Are they asking the student to, um, after reading, um, speak about something? What um, is being asked of the student? And then we look up here at the proficiency level and we think through um, these uh, bullet points and how they can um, carry out that task. Um, and so what is the task? So here for the purpose of this um, review, I have pulled up the uh, module three, end of module assessment for grade three um, in the Wit and Wisdom curriculum. And so I'm going to read it really quickly. The task is to choose one of the situations below. Describe the moment from the point of view of the main character in the text. Base your narrative on what you have learned about immigration, traditions, and settling in a new home. Be sure to include dialogue and descriptions of the character's thoughts, feelings, and actions. Okay, and then down here they've um, listed out the moments that the student would be able to choose from as well as the um, supporting texts um, from which the student would um, pull supporting evidence. For the purpose of this video, I just went ahead and I chose Anna helping her mother and neighbors making the keeping quilt. Um, I also think that that's a really powerful first step when these tasks are asking students um, to choose um, and giving them choice sort of can be a point of confusion for newcomers. And so when you have the opportunity to choose for them, I say go ahead and choose it um, so that it takes that piece out. Um, so then what you want to do is go back up here to this task, um, reread it. You're watching this asynchronously, so feel free to stop the video at any time, pause it, um, think through what key use area, um, I'm going to be looking at. What is this task asking my students to do? So if you want to go ahead and pause the video now, you can do so. Um, and we'll hop into the can do descriptors when you come back. Okay, so you've taken time to read through the task um, once again, and now we're going to hop back into the um, can do document and scroll back up to the key uses. Um, so we're thinking, what is this task asking my students to do? So I actually went back and forth between explain and recount because the, the task is asking you to explain um, from a uh, the main character's point of view, how they felt and how they um, acted, um, so on and so forth. Um, but when I looked more closely at explain, it's asking, in terms of explain, um, it means to clarify the why or the how of ideas, actions, or phenomena. So that's more of like a life cycles or a, um, explaining step by step some sort of like issue or action or phenomena. Um, and so I settled on recount um, because the students are being asked to narrate an experience. Um, and it is, although it's from another person's point of view, um, I just felt like recount fit best with this activity. Okay, so we're going to scroll into recount. Um, and how are they being asked to recount? They're being asked to do so via writing. Okay, and for the purpose of this video, we are, um, our fictional student is a newcomer with a proficiency level of 1.0, a level one. OK, um, and so they're being asked or they could be expected to recount via writing by labeling images that illustrate the steps for different processes um, and creating visual representations of stories. 
So a lot of times what I feel like or what I've seen happen is teachers look at the Hughes area. They say, okay, they're asking them to write or they're asking them to listen or they're asking them to speak. And they only sort of stay in that box um, to create their scaffolds. And a lot of times I feel like um, that becomes more of a struggle as opposed to um, what I've begun doing is looking at the... um, obviously the key use area and the language domain that is um, specifically pertaining to this activity initially. But then if I feel like, okay, I need more support um, with getting ideas for scaffolding, I'm going to look at this in a more holistic um, way. So I'm going to go through each language domain and sort of pull from that um, what my scaffolds could look like and sort of piece it together that way um, as opposed to just staying in this Um, writing domain. And so I'm going to just take a minute, read through it. You can do the same. You can pause the video now and read through it. I'm going to read through it aloud. If you want to read through it with me, um, that's also fine. So in terms of listening, students can um, show or recount via showing what happens next based on familiar oral stories. For example, point or drawing, um, drawing or providing other visual displays of people, animals, or objects in response to oral prompts. In terms of speaking, recounting via speaking, students can be expected to be responding to questions related to stories or experiences. For example, who came to the door, acting out and naming events or experiences throughout the school day. Okay, And then in terms of recounting uh, via reading, students um, are expected to be identifying keywords and phrases in illustrated text, signaling language associated with content related information, for example, during preview, view, and review. Okay, so all of these things have helped me to sort of create this, again, more holistic view of what scaffolds could look like for this student in... um, connection to this task, okay? And so now I'm gonna jump back into the presentation to show you what I came up with in terms of recommendations. Okay, so we did wanna make sure we were using the text um, because again, that was one of the requirements of the assessment. The students should be um, providing evidence from the text um, to support um, their point of view. But instead of just having the keeping quote page 20 and it's printed out and the picture is there and we're looking at the picture and just using it in some sort of abstract way, we're going to put speech bubbles onto the page to represent dialogue. You're going to have pre-written and pre-cut, pre-cut because we want to save on time, sentences for students to listen to and paste into boxes or speech bubbles pertaining to how Anna felt. Um, We're going to make sure that we include sentences that do not describe Anna's thoughts, feelings, and actions in order to truly gauge understanding. And so what I mean by that is I have these pre-written sentences, I'm pointing to it and reading it aloud, and then the student is saying, yes, that is how, or they don't have to expand on this sentence, they could simply say yes or no. Um, But we do wanna have some that don't represent um, how Anna truly thought or truly felt, because if a student has all the um, correct answers and all they have to do is say yes, 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 then that's not really, um, it's not challenging them in any way. And then you as an educator really don't have a good understanding of whether or not they truly um, are picking up on this information. And then you could take it one step further and have the students complete um, a sentence. If this is a newcomer, a sentence listing descriptions of a completed or the completed image. So once the student has pasted the sentences into the speech bubbles um, underneath, they could complete a sentence. Anna feels um, happy or Anna feels proud. Anna feels, you know, whatever. Um, And these words are being pulled from a word bank or these words could be pulled from the sentence strips. Um, Maybe you highlighted some of the keywords within the sentence so that the student could pull those words, um, have some point of reference, and then write it into um, the blank. Okay, all right, so we practiced via the end of module three for grade three. What I want to do right now is to review really quickly our steps of can-do scaffolding, how we use our can-dos in order to begin scaffolding. So step one, we look at our activity, okay? 
and we really look at the task, we digest it, we understand what this task is asking the student to do. Then we cross-reference with our can-do descriptors. We make a point to look at our key uses to think which key use area um, is this task pertaining to. We scroll into that key use area and we think through how they are being asked to um, showcase recounting or arguing or ex explanation. Um, and we look at that um, language domain area first, but if we need more support in terms of creation of those scaffolds, then we are going to look at the, um, the area holistically. So we can look at all four language domains um, to get a better idea of what scaffolds we could implement for um, said student. And then we're going to um, create a list of those scaffolds. If you are a content teacher, you're just creating the scaffolded version of the assessment, the modified version of the assessment. If you are an ESOL teacher, you are collaborating with your content teachers to um, you know, share these scaffolds that you both can be putting in place to support that student. Okay, and our last piece is going to be you going off and looking at one of your assignments upcoming um, to think through how you're going to use the can-do descriptors to modify that assessment for your English learners at um, the various placement levels, okay? And again, this was a short asynchronous sort of review of the can-do descriptors, what they are, how the document is organized, and how you could utilize it to begin or continue scaffolding your um, activities within your class. But if you want to do a um, more in-depth synchronous session and more specific to maybe your um, content or your um, grade level, then that would be a, um, again, that would be a synchronous session and feel free to reach out um, to get that established and um, get your teachers practicing scaffolding via these can-do descriptors with me. Um, if you don't already know, my name is Amherst Miller. I am the ESOL Educational Associate for our smaller and mid-sized sites. And you can reach me here at this email um, and feel free to contact me that way and I really am here to support so please 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 if you found this valuable or beneficial feel free to contact me and I will um, be more than happy to support all right guys I will see you soon and thanks for watching